Thank you, Eric. Thank you, HubZero, for inviting me here today. I'm going to talk about SitFiBio.org. My name is Katrina Tice, and as Eric mentioned, I work at the National Cancer Institute, which is one of the 27 institutes and centers of the National Institutes of Health based in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, I run SitFiBio.org along with a, um, a working group here at NIH, which I'll talk about in a moment. And SitFiBio.org is a biomedical citizen science hub, which centers on uh, biomedical citizen science and crowdsourcing um, sort of as they fit into the broader field of open innovation. And today I'm going to cover a few things in a very broad way. So this is going to be a very different presentation than, than uh, the one you guys just saw, a lot less um, data and a lot more really broad sweeping overviews. Um, so please feel free to uh, interrupt me with any questions. Um, happy to take them either throughout the presentation or afterwards, you know, whatever works for you guys. Um, so today I'll be talking about open innovation, biomedical citizen science and crowdsourcing, um, the working group that is behind this hub that supports the work that we do, um, how this all fits into the broader realm of open innovation, and of course, the hub itself. So we're going to do a quick intro into the world of open innovation. Um, so this is open innovation sort of in the way that the NIH Citizen Science Working Group sees it and NIH sort of broadly sees it. Um, and I'm going to start by saying that this slide is inaccurate because this field is constantly moving, it's constantly evolving. New terms are being developed all the time, terms are changing meaning all the time here. So when I say citizen science, sometimes that broadly encompasses other terms such as do-it-yourself uh, biology and maker spaces, but not always. So it's a little, it's, it's a little bit complex. Um, we are, we at the NIH Citizen Science Working Group are focused on public engagement in research, primarily citizen science, which involves the engagement of uh, the public in any aspect of research. So that could be research priority setting, that could be data gathering or data donation, uh, data analysis, uh, dissemination of results. Uh, Etc. So, um, we tend to use citizen science as an umbrella term in, in that way, although I think open innovation is rapidly becoming the more appropriate and all-encompassing umbrella term for uh, various forms of engaging the public with the traditional researchers in, in scientific endeavors. Um, we're also interested in crowdsourcing, which um, I'm sure many of you know what that is, but really quick, it's when you uh, take a project or a task and you break it up into smaller tasks and sort of farm that out to um, either specific groups or the broader general public. Um, much of that is done online, much of it is uh, unpaid or volunteered center. And then um, uh, another thing we focus on a lot is community-based participatory research or CVPR. NIH has a rich history in funding CVPR primarily, or at least it used to be, um, where a member of a community, whether that is uh, regional, local, cultural, um, uh, disease-based, et cetera, um, that's being studied, would uh, send a representative to sit on an advisory panel that's overseeing the scientific work being done in that community. Um, so their involvement was there, but not quite as interactive and engaging and collaborative as it is in citizen science. But lately, we've been seeing an uptick in CBPR um, applications that include a much more visible and much more um, integrated role in the scientific process. So we're seeing that CBPR and, and citizen science are becoming much more interrelated. So um, as you can see, there's a lot of other things here on this screen uh, that we're also interested in. Um, and, and they, these topics are all quite related, but not necessarily the same. Um, and like I said, they're changing all the time. So um, this static image isn't quite accurate, but it does give you a little snapshot of where our focus is to give you an idea of the mindset that we have when we, um, the, sort of the, the world, world view or filter through which we see our work. Okay, and I mentioned that the Citizen Science Working Group is is, the, is what the driving force is behind this hub. Um, a little bit about us. We started in 2012 
with about 40-ish people, and we have grown to um, over 100 members from 19 of the institutes and centers, or ICs, uh, plus the office of the director, that's Francis Collins' office. Um, we have had four workshops to kind of explore different areas of biomedical citizen science. We started off with a think tank that brought in experts from across um, the field of citizen science, if you can call it a field or a movement, um, that uh, encompassed let's see, academics, nonprofits, for profits, you know, private industry, um, and of course, uh, feds um, and others as well. Um, and they came up with a few directions for us. They came up with some guiding principles, which I will talk about in a moment, but also some areas of interest. Um, and they, they saw for us that there were a few unique areas that NIH could really help um, in terms of um, adding our, our um, scientific rigor to, to these approaches. So, for example, games for biomedical research, using games as a methodology behind research in, in biomedical research. Um, they also saw that um, ethical, legal, social implications of biomedical citizen science were vastly different than um, those the same concerns for, say, ecological citizen science. So like going out in your backyard and counting butterflies and donating that data is vastly different than donating your own personal health data, for example. Um, skipping ahead a little, we've had a symposium recently um, for other NIH staff to kind of get them more involved and up to date on what's going on in this field where we brought in um, where we paired citizen scientists so volunteers with um, the uh, PIs from um, three different projects to talk about their work and their perspectives um, on how it was to work on a project of this nature. And um, all of the materials, including the video cast archive of that meeting, are available on SITSI Bio, so you can find it all there. Um, and I'm happy to share that link with you guys, so you can go check it out. Um, we have an upcoming forum for the National Cancer Institute on citizen science and crowdsourcing. That's actually next Thursday. And um, our working group has given many presentations across other working group meetings, um, federal meetings, NIH workshops, small conferences, large conferences, uh, citizen science-based conferences, and not citizen science-based conferences um, to help get the word out about this. Uh, we also uh, work across the Department of Health and Human Services, where we are uh, in which we are situated. We are one of their family, we're part of their family of agencies. Um, so we work with FDA, CDC, um, CMS, ARC, HRSA um, to get a sense of what they're doing and understand um, where their work is coming from and, and which forms of open innovation they've embraced. Um, uh, a couple of us are part of the leadership in the federal community of practice on crowdsourcing and citizen science, which is about 500 members of um, federal innovators from across, I want to say, 63 agencies. Um, and we have in the past participated in White House open innovation activities during the Obama administration. Much of that work was coordinated through our NIH agency coordinator for citizen science and crowdsourcing, my uh, supervisor, Jennifer Couch. And then, of course, as we are here today to talk about it, um, we also run sitsibio.org. So, um, as I mentioned before, we had that think tank back in 2012 where we brought in experts across the field to kind of assess what NIH could do in this space if NIH was welcome in this space. And they said, yeah, you are, and here's some things you need to think about when you go forward. Um, people are, are creative. The public is creative. They can provide all sorts of data and insights that you would not be able to get through, you know, traditional uh, methods and people are eager and able to solve problems if you give them the right opportunities and, and, and tools to do so. And part of that is, is not just handing them stuff and walking away. It's asking what they need and then working together to provide it. Um, and the next thing, um, anyone with a social media account can verify this. Patients and healthy individuals are motivated to collect and share personal health data, and this even means if they know that perhaps they have a condition and, it, and the data they're providing isn't actually going to help them, but it could help someone else. There's a few studies that have been showing that this is a, a, um, a fairly consistent trend, that people are willing to share data even if it's not going to help them, but could potentially help someone else or drive uh, the field forward. 
And of course, as I mentioned earlier, biomedical research poses unique challenges for citizen science, and that's something that has to be kept in mind um, with every project you put forward. Um, and this, I can't stress enough. These methods, they're new to us, but they're not actually new. They've been around for a while, many of them. Um, they, they're, they're more meant to be complementary to existing research approaches, not replace them. And, and that I can't stress enough. They're not necessarily appropriate for every research uh, question or every set of methods. So, With that in mind, um, when, uh, part of the feedback we got at that first think tank was that many, uh, many sets of, of, of resources, tools, approaches, et cetera, were spread out and, 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 and dispersed um, and sort of difficult to find. So one of the pieces of feedback we received was, well, if there could be some sort of clearinghouse, there's a lot of websites, there are many, many communities uh, that exist mostly virtually. Is there a way to keep kind of track of that and, and, and help promote um, and share resources? And so we thought, well, why don't we try this? this so sitsibio.org is a, a resource for research, education, and collaboration in biomedical citizen science and crowdsourcing. So really we went into this with the intent to uh, make a, a, an online sort of collaboratory for people to come together and share resources, find resources, work on projects together, um, share references, find methods, and, 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 and um, other pieces of, of citizen science that are in, uh, of interest to our um, various stakeholders. So this broad community also has varying levels of technological expertise and comfort. So you have to keep in mind, like, how, do you, how do you address um, this issue on the hub? And, and so we went into it from a design perspective of, well, let's reduce barriers to access. Uh, let's make it so anyone can, can grab a public-facing resource without being a member, first off, and have everything be free, but also to keep it simple and clean um, and easy to create an account, easy to log in, um, easy to manage your stuff. So if you go to sitsidebio.org, you can see that it's a very, it's a, it's a fairly clean and minimalistic design. Um, we try to keep up with a very consistent and, and in my not so humble opinion, very pleasant color scheme are my favorite colors, um, but also um, to keep it um, consistent and, and, and clean throughout the site. Um, so in reducing barriers to access, we wanted to make it really easy to log in, and many people use Facebook as their uh, login for various apps and websites. So, um, so we have a Facebook API. We also have a, um, a uh, of SciStarter login. So we've partnered with SciStarter, which is primarily a database of uh, citizen science projects. And they have projects that run the gamut from um, ecology to astronomy. Um, they have some biomedical ones on there as well. They have, um, I think they have some projects that are more um, uh, archive-based, so some, some projects from the National Archives and the Smithsonian. Um, and so what we've done is made it so that you can use your SciStarter account to log in to Sitside Bio, or you can link your two accounts. And either way, you can receive credit on SciStarter for the work that you've done on Sitside Bio. So this way, users can very easily track through this API what they've done across different projects. And SciStarter can also track uh, where their users are going. So how much are they doing in respect to um, this topic or that topic, and how many projects are they working on? If they uh, are involved in Sitsai Bio, are they also more involved in other biomedical stuff, or is it more of a mix? Um, and so they've managed to produce some really robust data on uh, their users without mm, you know, it's all it's all de-identified, but there it's really interesting data on, you know, if you like this, do you also like this? And, and, and um, I'm not sure what they intend to do with that data, except to um, really optimize uh, their services and, and try to um, streamline their processes. So, 
Um, so our central focus at Sitside Bio has been on groups, forming groups, um, having an up-to-date calendar of events. Now these are not Sitside Bio events. These are more broadly sort of uh, biomedical citizen science related events or anything they might find relevant. Um, resources, of course, and projects. It's kind of where we thought it would go. Um, but as you can see, that's not completely where it went. We've got about 350 members, about five active groups or so, um, 18 resources, six collections, 80 events, uh, seven blog entries, and 17 newsletters. Now, most of the feedback we've received is that people really like the calendar, they are really enjoying the Twitter account, and um, I think the, the biggest hit really is the, the newsletter. So um, I only have a couple minutes, so I'm going to end with the newsletter. We're just going to talk about that briefly. Um, so um, this newsletter is delivered the second Friday of every month to two lists of people, those who have opted to receive Hub emails and others who've indicated interest. Um, and I've made sure to keep those lists pretty clean and separate so there's no overlap. We don't want to have people receiving the same email twice. Um, and it features mostly you know, news, if there's anything newsworthy going on that's relevant to biomedical citizens, science, job postings, and again, not through Sitai Bio, but um, from other sources as well, funding opportunities, um, any kind of upcoming events, and publicly accessible journal articles that are relevant. These uh, publicly accessible journal articles, we've got over 960 of them so far in a sort of uh, bibliography that I created through um, PubMed Central um, that anyone can access. And um, this, we, this, um, this bibliography is updated weekly. I mean, anybody can go into to PubMed Central and, and find publicly available journal articles, but this helps to keep them sort of in one, one place. Um, and some of these items are posted on Sitside Bio in general, but many are not, either because there's no real natural space for that information to be shared on Sitside Bio or it just doesn't make sense for it to be there. For example, job postings. Many of them are open until filled, and they're not, I'm, I'm not the admin on those jobs. I'm not the hiring official. Um, so to maintain that would be a little bit much. So, um, you know, and funding opportunities live on grants.gov. They already have a home, so the newsletter sort of acts as like an ag almost like an aggregation of, of these various forms of news and jobs and, and um, bits of interest in the community. So since most of this already exists out where, out, uh, elsewhere, I just sort of use this as a way to link out. And all of our newsletters are archived on the website and easily available through either the Discover link in the mega menu on the main page, or you could just go to sitsidebio.org slash newsletter, and they're all there. So they, it also acts as a record of um, you know, how uh, topics of interest and things sort of change over time. Um, and I'm just about out of time. so. Um, I'm going to end there and happy to take any questions.